Hi, everyone. Alexandra here, and I'm going solo today with the podcast. I miss Dotsie, but she will be back next week. So just a few thoughts before we start this interview. One thing I've been thinking about lately is rules, especially like food and health rules. I was listening to Taylor Swift's song uh, yesterday, Coulda, Shoulda, Woulda, and it made me think of how often we berate ourselves with these words. So just putting those two things together um, reminded me that many of my health coaching clients come to me with a lot of guilt because they've heard what they need to do to uh, be doing to be healthy, and they're not managing to live that way. So they feel like they're bad, they're wrong, they're weak. I don't know. Can you relate to this? And that's because there's so many different opinions out there of about how to live a healthy life, how many hours to sleep, when to eat, when to eat what to eat, um, what kind of exercise you should do, how much, blah, blah, blah. I, I mean, I am reading two health books right now, and they almost contradict each other. So it can be really hard to figure out what kind of health routine is best for you. And I've come to the conclusion that we should take the basic habits that we all know that are good for us and tailor it to our lives and what makes us happy. And if you deviate from your favorite health guru or your friend circle, that is okay. I mean, this isn't a license to go to bed late all the time or eat a lot of fast food and all that. But when I... When I get a new client, I always tell them, you know what's healthy for you. You know what makes you feel good. I mean, it's pretty basic. We eat lots of vegetables and foods in their whole state, get seven to nine hours of sleep, exercise consistently, drink water above all other beverages. And I would say have more love and less stress. Those are the basic health tenets. And how you balance those in your life is completely up to you. Please don't try to be perfect if you're brisk walking every day and that's all you can fit in and you can't lift weights right now, then just feel proud of what you're doing. Make sure they, these healthy routines work into your life and just don't be too hard on yourself if you can't incorporate some healthy trend. Um, seriously, you are unique and therefore there is no cookie, cookie cutter program that's going to fit with you for the long term. Um, so, uh, so I'm hoping that this show helps you craft your own health routine. Now I still have moments when I'm down on myself. And for me, it's usually, I think, ah, oh, I should change up my workout program to challenge myself. Or I say, oh, I shouldn't eat so late at night because I always have a snack right before bed. And then I realize, come on, Alexandra, you're doing great. I mean, you are doing great. All those basic health things you're, you're doing um, maybe not as much as some of the health gurus out there say, and not as quote unquote well, but you're doing great for you, the balance in your life. So stop wasting time thinking of all the things that could have, should have, would have, <laughs> and just live. So I tell myself, do the best that you can. And I want to tell you that too. I think our guest today would agree that even though she's achieved in the gym and with her body uh, a lot it's good. It's a lot more than most of us will ever do. She, she would say, take a nugget from our conversation and let it inspire you, not whip you. Um, and I think we both want you to be good to yourself health wise. Yeah. But we also want you to have compassion for yourself and your busy life. So let's get on with the interview and remember that no coulda, shoulda, wouldas, unless it's a Taylor Swift song. <laughs> Does your doctor live by example? Our guest today is a doctor who certainly walks her talk and then some. Dr. Harriet Davis is an expert on what it takes to change the human body's composition. Not only is she a board certified family medicine and sports medicine physician, but at the age of 40, she applied her fitness and plant-based nutrition mastery and launched another career competing as a professional bikini athlete. She earned her International Fitness and Bodybuilding Federation Pro Card in 2014 and graced stages throughout the United States, thus showing the world and her patients what's possible as a 100% vegan athlete. I'm very excited to have this living testament to the benefits of plant-based nutrition, share her inspiring story and wealth of knowledge 
with our audience. Welcome, Dr. Harriet Davis. Thank you so much for having me, Alexandra. I want to talk about a bunch of things today because I'm so excited to have you on. But let's let's talk about your origin story um, personally from omnivore to vegetarian and then to vegan. Yes. So, you know, I like to tell people, I think I was born to be a vegan. And, you know, they kind of side eye me when I say that. But, you know, for as long as I could remember growing up, I've always had issues digesting meats. And what I remember was beef, chicken, but especially like beef. I never, I just always seemed to have an aversion to it. So there was, you know, always little Harriet misbehaving behind um, what we're eating today. A couple of things I would say happened that kind of started, you know, me to look at um, nutrition. Unfortunately, when I was 10, my father died from a massive heart attack and he was the age that I am now, he was 51 when he died from that heart attack. He had had them before, but that was the one that, you know, took him out, but also gave me my purpose in life. And so that period of time between him being age 47 to 51, my mom was following all the, the guidelines and the recommendations that his cardiologist had, you know, given us so that he could basically not take his health for granted. And so on a day that was very devastating for me, you know, all I could really think about was why would he not just listen to the doctor? And so I really started looking at food a little bit differently. I would say, you know, maybe from the age of seven to 10, because we were eating differently. So when I graduated from high school and went to college, which I went to NC State here in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, the first thing I decided was I'm going to take out like red meats and we really weren't eating a lot of pork, but I, I was just like, I'm taking it out because I know it's giving me heartburn. I know it's making me have um, slow transit or constipation. You know, I, I just knew that from my childhood. So, you know, I was away from home. It wasn't going to be a sign of disrespect. I mean, you have all the options you want, you know, for food choices. There's lots of different things and cuisines. And so it was really good for me. There were more people at NC State than in my hometown. So if that tells you <laughs> anything and, you know, I just noticed I felt better, like I wasn't having as many digestive issues. And so I just gradually started like taking different meats out, but I left fish because I, I loved fish. I mean, it, it didn't really make me feel bad or anything. And so by the time I finished NC State, I taught there for two years after, before I went to med school, I was still eating pretty much, you know, most things and fish. So, you know, what now people say is pescatarian. So I still had dairy. One day, a uh, group of friends and I were walking and we went to Ben and Jerry's. We did not have a Ben and Jerry's in my hometown. We had a Dairy Queen, which I'm sure is much less milk fat than, you know, this rich Ben and Jerry's. And so I got ice cream. And before we could even get back to the apartment, because we walked, I was sick. I mean, I, I knew I had to go to the bathroom. You know, I felt like I, I was cramping in my colon. It was awful. And so that was my first exposure to lactose intolerance, which I later learned in school. You know, most mammals should not be consuming cow's milk. I mean, we're not cows and definitely not as an adult. So that made it pretty easy for me to remove dairy. Well, I won't say dairy. Let me let me be accurate. Milk and ice cream because I was still eating cheese. I was still eating eggs and I was still getting sick. But I couldn't pinpoint what is making me sick. And the sickness has always been my digestion. You know, it's always been something with my digestion. So, you know, I've gone from a kid who grandmother is always trying to give me some type of laxative or fiber supplement, you know, and I'm drinking water and I was active to now an adult who is afraid to eat because something's going to make me sick. And it's like a it's, it's not a good, it's not a good look. So you went so, from constipation, but when you were eating lots of meat to diarrhea and, if, and it, but I couldn't figure out what was caught. Yes. Yeah. But I couldn't figure out what was causing that. Mm -hmm. And that went on, you know, so I kept trying to say, okay, well, it's cheese. So I'll take cheese out. But then it just, 
kept coming, but it was so intermittent. I couldn't figure out what was causing it. So I get through med school, I get through residency, and I'm still pretty much eating some dairy. So I'm I'm a vegetarian. You know, that was that long period of time where I'm eating what we like to say lacto ovo vegetarian. So I still had some dairy products, you know, and eggs. And once I finished my residency, my fellowship, then when I moved to Virginia Beach to start my first job, my brother and his family came over from Germany to visit. And because I knew I was vegetarian and I was going to have a hard time finding food at the beach, I made this little salad that, you know, really wasn't a salad, but it's, you know, apples, raisins, carrots, and mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. And and I grabbed some crackers. And so, and I, in looking back, I wasn't counting macros then either. I was a huge runner. So I just wanted to be able to eat something besides just pizza crust or, you know, something crazy. And so I ate that on the way down to the oceanfront. And by the time, like, you know, and I'm licking the mayonnaise off my finger, not on purpose, but, you know, just trying to get my salad down. And once we started being active, it happened. And it's like a light bulb went off in my head. And it was also very embarrassing for me because you've got to stop what you're doing. You got to find a clean restroom. It would be so anxiety provoking, you know. And so um, that's when just a light bulb went off. And I'm like, it's eggs. And I, and it just started making sense. And so when I moved back to North Carolina, I joined a church and in Charlotte, which was close to where I was from. And the pastor was talking about Daniel's fast. And so he was just saying, this is what me and my wife are doing. And, you know, if you want to do some spiritual cleansing or take some things out of your diet, processed foods or other things, you know, we're doing this for 40 days you know, there's a book, blah, blah, blah. So ordered the book, realized that, or maybe I went to the store and bought it, realized that there were recipes in the back. And I did this for 40 days, not knowing it was vegan. Didn't know, didn't know. Felt so good. And then I decided I'm going to start eating like this. And, And that's really my journey to how I went from, you know, the standard American diet to a 100% plant-based diet, which I have been maintaining for the past 16 years. And to great effect. So what I'm hearing, I'm surprised that as a doctor, you didn't realize that as an African-American woman, you might be um, susceptible to lactose intolerance. Did they not talk about that in medical school at all? They, we, we, we talk about things, but that would be like later in like when you're out in your clinical rotation. So, you know, like in preparation for that. And so really, if I think about it, you know, when like I I started off interested in surgery, so I did nutrition because it was related to surgical nutrition and burns and, you know, those things. And so you, you do get exposed to some things, but, you know, everything is, is so much inpatient based when you're in training. So, you know, you don't really talk about that. As far as, you know, nobody's going to be in the hospital for lactose intolerance, but they may be in for celiac disease. So you're, you're, you're talking about those things. You were uh, always an athlete. You mentioned you were an active kid. You were a long distance runner. You've done a bunch of marathons and ultra marathons, uh, 30 K races. What made you transition from long distance running to bodybuilding? Well, I will be. 100% transparent. I didn't even want to transition at all. Um, I've been a runner my entire life. I was also a dancer. My mom was someone, it is someone who believes you need to be active, you know? So I, I, I greatly appreciate her philosophy, you know, because I tell my patients all the time, movement is medicine and food is medicine and laughter is medicine. So, um, I, I ran my whole life and mainly because I've always had too much energy. (laughs) So that's why, so that's why my mom kept me active because she's like, you're going to wear me out. Running has just always been that thing that just makes me feel good, dumps the dopamine, you know, and it helped me burn some of the energy that I had. And so, you know, I did it as long as I could. Well, when I turned 40, I started to notice that my body looked different. 
And the scale wasn't necessarily moving up or down, but just everything looked soft. Like I had never really been one that lifted weights, but I, I like I said, I did ballet, I did tap, I did jazz. I was a flag girl. So I'm waving a pole. I'm a cheerleader, you know, so all in running. So all those things, I think just kept my muscles looking conditioned and looking like I was lifting weights, but I wasn't. So I like to say when I hit 40 or approached 40, I out kind of ran my genetics because I, I feel like one of the things we don't talk about, and I'm hoping later in life, this will be my gig when I retire is how early perimenopause starts, you know, and so, and those changes that start. So at 40, you know, I'm looking at myself and I'm like, what happened to the definition in my arms? It wasn't completely gone, but it, I just didn't look hard. My body just didn't look hard anymore. And so I started running more and my ex-husband was also away in the military. And like I said, I think running was a way for me to kind of have control when I, you know, felt like everything was out of control. So I'm working full time. I'm raising, you know, our son by myself, who's very active as well. He inherited that from me. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not liking the aesthetics of it all. Like, I, I don't understand what I'm seeing. And so, you know, I'm running more miles. So this is the point where I was running like 60 miles a week. So I'm getting stress injuries and still my body isn't changing. Then I just was like, you know what? This is a lot of work. You need to hire a personal trainer. So I hired a trainer. And also, Alexandra, this was the year that I went raw. So I did a year of being raw. And I think that was, I'm not going to say it was a rock bottom for me, but it was a rock bottom in my deficit in nutrition because that's, you know, I'm getting all these stress injuries. I feel, I felt great. You know, I felt amazing, but my weight wasn't changing. Mm. My body composition was looking different and it wasn't looking different in a way that I liked, you know, I just looked soft. And I just was frustrated because I didn't know what to do. Was it because you went raw that you felt your body changed or was it because of perimenopause? I think two things. I think it was both. I think it was the hormonal changes that start so early that, you know, we don't think about because you're menstruating regularly. Um, But also, you know, I went vegan that, I mean, raw vegan that year because it was my 40th year. You know, people talk about 40 years of purpose and those things. And so, you know, I was like, I'm going to make it a whole year raw vegan. So I'm, you know, dehydrating and all of this, not looking at any macronutrients, you know, and just exploring different recipes, juicing a whole lot. So I'm not eating my food. I'm drinking my food. You know, so you're getting a lot more sugar. I think a lot of times people think, oh, I juice, you know, it's healthy. It depends on who you are and what you're working towards. I mean, if you're morbidly obese, probably is, you know, but if you're not and you're you have a goal to, you know, put muscle on or it, or increase your lean muscle mass, it may be OK for one of your meals or snacks, but it shouldn't be what you're doing all day. And so, you know, I was just basically eating a lot of carbs and fiber and not really paying attention to, well, where, what's going on with protein. Mm-hmm. So that I sought out a trainer here in Charlotte who's vegan. Um, and so I started training with this vegan trainer and he looked at my nutrition because, you know, you have to send all the things you're eating. And he was like, in my mind, I'm trying to make it a whole year without going back to cooked food or, you know, heating things up to a certain temperature. And he was like, well, what I'm noticing is that you're drinking all of your calories, you know, or you're, you're eating these things that are healthy, but they're not necessarily beneficial for the goals that you have set for yourself. And because I am an overachiever, I was still trying to run. I was still trying to run all these miles Right. And strength training. I, I I wasn't ready to let go of that yet. And so he respected my wishes and we made it that year. I think I hired him in like August and I needed to just make it till November or something like that for it to be a complete year of me eating raw. And so um, once he looked at my nutrition and made some suggestions, it was my first real introduction to, you know, how 
vegan nutrition or any nutrition should be tailored to the goals of the athlete or the patient. I can't just cookie cutter and say, well, this is what you need to do. And that's what most people do. And so, you know, once we started looking at my goals, um, that's what allowed me to be more receptive as to, okay, I do need to eat this or I have to eat this, you know, X amount of meals in a day. So not only was I probably not getting enough, you know, of the calories that I needed for the amount of energy that I was expending in exercise, but then I wasn't necessarily meeting my macronutrient, you know, requirements to make this muscle come back. So I was basically just feeding the adipose tissue. So, so are you saying that um, calories, because you're, you probably had a lower calorie count than you d- that you did w- after you started weightlifting, but yet you didn't like the way your body looked. Correct. Is that because, are you saying that it's important to lift weights um, because it will build muscle and, and just lowering calorie count will not make you lose good weight? Cause we Correct. can lose, Correct. we can lose lean muscle mass, but we might not be losing the fat. That is correct. And and so there were this was so eye-opening to me because you know we know about body composition, but thinking about that in relationship to how your body is changing, you know, and then trying to figure out through it all is like you said, is this hormonal? I was really in that old school train of thought. So this is a conversation I have with patients several times a day is most Americans are under consuming their calories. And so I have, you know, people coming in and they're saying, okay, I exercise and they may not be, you know, exercising to the max, but they are moving, you know, they can show me in their, you know, Apple, I mean, their iPhone or whatever, their, their movement goals and all those things. So they're exercising and they are eating what they think is, is appropriate calories but their weight isn't moving and they think something's wrong or they have to have a thyroid condition or it has to be something else. And a lot of times it's simply because their caloric intake is too low. And so when that happens, your body just senses like a steady state. It's not going to, you're not going to lose that weight. And that was something that was hard for me to wrap my head around as I progressed and became a pro athlete. And then, you know, I remember asking one of my coaches, So when I increase my calories like this, am I going to gain weight? And he said, honestly, I don't know. I'm sure he did know, but I trusted the process as uncomfortable as it was. And I didn't gain weight. I lost weight. You lost body fat. Correct. But But I'm saying you might have weighed more on the scale, right? But your body fat composition would be uh, lower body fat, more muscle and and I, I should definitely clarify when I say weight, I'm talking about, like you said, adipose tissue. I gained lean mass, but also like my body composition changed in a way in which I liked. The scale may only fluctuate by five pounds, you know. I mean, and a lot, and really, I was a lot underweight. So, strength training helped me a lot. It helped me in so many different ways. Um, because I, number one, discovered I loved exercise at the age of 40. I thought I only loved running. You know, I didn't think anything would ever satisfy that itch or, you know, just satisfy me the way running did because it gives you such a high, you know, you feel so good. And I discovered in, you know, at the age of 40, once I agreed, okay, I can't run 10 miles and then come and train legs with my trainer if I'm trying to grow glutes and hamstrings, <laughs> you know, like, duh. And <laughs> so, um, but not, no, no, not duh, because a lot of people think more is better. I should have known mm-hmm. just in general. I mean, if you're, if your whole anterior chain is together because you run and you're using your quads and I'm a distance runner, whereas sprinters, you know, a little different. And I don't have, I had no glutes, no hamstrings. I was just straight down in the back. Um, you know, you can't keep doing that, but I just, Sometimes we get so focused on our goals that we forget. And I've learned so many lessons, you know, like I said, I mean, as far as if I've hired somebody to help me do something, take your hands off of it and trust that, you know? And so to get back to your question, um, correct. When the calories are too low, then a lot of times what happens is, is that you continue to lose lean muscle mass because 
you know, nobody's really getting anything. And then, so it makes the fat look more prevalent. So let, let's, let's um, be more specific because I don't want people coming away from our conversation thinking they can just eat more and therefore right. the fat will come off. What was it that you think, and as a bodybuilder, you're a pro, not only as a bodybuilder, you're a pro, but um, at changing body composition, you have you have sort of the secret sauce that a lot of people want because they feel out of control when it comes to their body composition. So what would you say to someone who's been dieting all their life? And let's say a woman, let's say a woman who's 40, because that definitely is a lot of our audience. Um, what would you say to her when she says, I want to look better? Uh, I want to have, which really means I want to have less body fat. Um, and look more toned. I think that's what most women want when they say yeah. want to lose weight. Yes. Um, I, I would tell them that we need to, you know, consider hiring or referring out to a registered dietitian. And to do what? To, to change their diet in what direction? So most of the dietitians that I use are medical, you know, dietitians. So they'll understand if that patient or person has underlying health conditions, you know, that's number one to me, that's important. If they're totally healthy, you know, I can just refer them to a regular dietitian, but to figure out what is your basal energy expenditure, right? So how much, how many calories do you burn just existing? Not, not exercising, just existing. So there are different, you know, tests that can be done to assess that. Um, even the, one of my gyms, I mean, they do, you know, that kind of testing. And then the other thing is figuring out active metabolic, you know, like testing, what forms of exercise are going to get you into that sweet spot. And this is aerobic exercise, right? For losing some of the body fat. So what forms of exercise should you be doing that are most efficient for you, you know, because we all have muscle different areas or we burn, you know, more calories with compound movements or other things. So that's important because then when you're going to the gym or you're working out, you're not wasting your time on a machine or like, you know, I use this all the time. If you're able to use a stair meal, you're probably going to burn a whole lot of calories. But if you've had that active metabolic testing done, is it now burning muscle too? The other aspect of this is your movement. So if this person has no experience in the gym, you know, then it, it would behoove them to at least have a, a few sessions or whatever with personal trainer. That's what I do. Not that I didn't have any experience, but I wanted to make sure, you know, I'm doing the things in a way that um, is going to benefit me for the goals that I've set for myself. Like, I don't want to just go and half lift things. You know, I want to know, do I push this hard or do I not? And then once you kind of have done that for a while, you're more comfortable training yourself. You're comfortable with, you know, counting your macros, putting them into my fitness pal or some, you know, food tracker. And over time, then you just kind of know you don't always have to do that. So, okay. So what I'm hearing from you, and by the way, folks, macros means protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And, and fiber. And fiber. fiber is a macro. Wow. But what I'm hearing is that we shouldn't over exercise over cardio because that'll break down muscle, especially if we're not eating enough Correct. and that lifting is important to build muscle. muscle. And I would like to add as, uh, as a woman that it's important also for our bones. Bones. Oh yes. Uh-huh. And also so that we remain toned and muscle burns more uh, burns more calories than fat, than fat and also keeps right. us met metabolically healthy. So there's many reasons to lift uh, and, and lift on the heavier side, not just yes. um, playing at it. Correct. <laughs> correct. Um, right. You're a hundred percent correct with that. Also, you know, lifting or some type of functional training where you're, you know, either, even if it's your body weight, depending on the age of the person, is going to also help with mobility. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to help with gait. So some people develop an unsteady gait because they have like stiffness or limitations in ranges of motion and other things. And then they start falling as they get older, you know, because they, they don't, they can't stand up, you know, they don't have enough quad strength. So they're trying to hold on or, you know, other things. So it's, it's important, even if you don't want to tone, you know, but it's, it's definitely important for all those things you said. 
Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsy and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page. That's Switch, the number four, and then Good. And then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. And what do you say to somebody, well, women, uh, who say, I don't want to get bulky? I've heard that so much. Um, explain, because you uh, you look amazing Thank you. And on stage, even though you have a lot of muscles, you aren't, you're still very feminine. Well, you, you competed in the bikini um, category. So that was part of the, the mandate wasn't necessarily being yes. the biggest, but the most proportional, but the best proportions and still retaining femininity, I imagine. Yes. So yes. what would you tell, say to a woman who's afraid to go into the gym because she feels like, oh, I just bulk up. What, what's, yeah. what, what, what is going, what does she need to do to, to get muscles, but not bulk up to make sure that, you know, she does do some strength training as well as some cardio, you know, it's just not all strength training and that there, I mean, the areas that she's worrying about bulking up, just don't train those so heavy. Like if you naturally have excellent quads or well-defined quads and you haven't lost any of that then, you know, maybe you don't do a whole lot of, you know, leg exercises for your quadriceps, but, you know, if your glutes are flat or if your arms, so a lot of people say, oh, I want my arms to look like that, or I want, you know, then you, you do have to train them, but you're not going to bulk up because you're weak at first. I mean, I go back and look at logs of when I first started and I could barely do like 25 pounds on, you know, certain things. And then, now that's, you know, you kind of look like what, you know, so it's, if you want to get bulky, you can, but it's going to take eating more, you know, I mean, a whole lot more. And that kind of gets into the macronutrients that you were talking about. Yeah. So one of the things that people always say is, well, how, where do you get your protein, which is a macronutrient, or I don't, I shouldn't be eating carbs. Now, depending on what their underlying health conditions are, <laughs> they may shouldn't, they may need to avoid simple carbs and processed foods, which are usually higher in carbs. Like I'm speaking of someone who has diabetes and let's just use for, you know, this example type two, meaning they weren't born with it. They have developed it because it was self-inflicted. They either were moving enough or they were eating too many carbs. So too many protein carbs. Correct. Too many, too many, you know, just simple carbohydrates or like drinking, what? like, like chips, like, uh, candies, like, um, breads, not, not fruit or no, um, no. not fruits, not potatoes, especially, you know, baked potatoes and, you know, those things. Um, but a, a lot of times just the comfort foods, you know, the, the snack foods that they're cookies and, you know, things that they're giving their children. Like I've had people tell me before, oh, I just snack on a few of those because I'm giving it to my five-year-old. And I'm like, but that that's adding to your, your caloric intake, you know? And so if you're not moving, that can uh, be affecting, you know, these calories that you're not understanding where that's coming from. So if you want to, let's just say there's a person who is overweight, so nobody we're speaking of right now is obese. They're they're overweight though. So their BMI is is not over 30, but it's like 25 or 26. And that's still subjective because <laughs> if they have muscle, you know, right. so it depends on how that's measured. And let's say that this person 
wants to lose 10 pounds, but they also want to tone. Mm -hmm. So what they're saying is, and this is the first thing I do is I explain toning if the muscle isn't there, so we should get a body composition. If that muscle isn't there, is putting on muscle. Because what are you toning? I mean, you tone your abs. Like most people have abdominal muscles. They just need to get lean enough so you can see them. And so for most women, that's the, depending on how old or young you are, that's the last thing that'll show up like as you get ready for a competition or as you're losing weight, you know? And so we tell women a lot of times, you might not need to do a whole lot of training on your abs because you will get blocky. You know, like if you're trying to have a slim waist, but if you want to give the appearance of a slim waist, then you might need bigger shoulders. It's an illu- a lot of things are illusions. But then also, so losing, f- so what, what I heard you say was that if there's no muscle, then you want to build up the muscle. At the same time, you might have too much fat, which would hide the muscle and just make you look bulky. So you'll be losing fat. And then you'll end up maybe with um, even smaller measurements, uh, even though you have so much more muscle. Correct. And most people then get to a point where they're not uh, like uh, so dedicated to the scale. You know, they're going to the in body machine where they're measuring their composition for that, you know, week or whatever. And that's the little machine where you walk up to and there's a plate and you take your shoes and your socks off and it's got these two arms and you just kind of hold on and it's measuring like impedance in your body and it's giving you a rough estimate. So it's kind of a combination of trying to do the calipers along with underwater weighing. There's bod pod where you can get your body composition. DEXA scan is really nice because, you know, it's pretty quick and you can see the little printout and your your shape. But the that's where also the nutrition becomes important, because if that same person that we're talking about wants to lose 10 pounds. And so let's say that for whatever their height and weight, you know, their BMI, as I said, was 26 or 25 and they're at 150 pounds and they want to go to 140 well, most of the time that dietitian is going to help me help them by number one, you know, kind of carving out a nutrition plan where your protein pretty much for someone who wants to put on muscle needs to be about a gram to a gram and a half of protein per pound of body weight for a female. Okay. So we'll just, we'll just talk about it for a female. Per pound or per kilogram? Just want to per pound. Okay. I'm not talking about the the true. I'm just saying a rough estimate. So I always tell people, like, if you want to weigh 140, and we're going for the one, you know, gram of protein per pound of body weight. There is a gram per kilogram, but I'm just saying this is easy for conversation. I said then roughly your protein needs to be at 140. Wow. So that's how you start to learn, and that's how that's what we would manipulate. For our competitions, you know, when in the off season, when you're bulking, so you do get larger because the scale is going to go up, your body fat's going to go up because you're working on areas and then it becomes fun because you're going to carve it all off and see, well, what sticks, how, well, how many of this, how many muscles are going to stay, you know, what's underneath all of this. So when you're, when, as a pro, you, a pro bodybuilder, you, you bulk up in both fat and muscle to, to get the most muscle really is what you're Correct. doing. And you eat Correct. More, so you can, and you work out hard and then, but you do less cardio. They usually bring your cardio down. Aha. Uh-huh. And then, and then the second phase is to lower the body fat. And how do you do that? Cause that's mm-hmm. what people want to know. It's kind of a balance. So like I said, You reverse diet, meaning the calories start gradually going back up. Once, you know, you've been on stage or let's say you were getting ready for a wedding. You know, if we make this applicable to anything other than bodybuilding, um, whatever class reunion you want to show off, you know, whatever it is. And let's say it's like, okay, now it means I've been doing you know, all these sessions of cardio, I've been killing it, but I don't know that I can do this. It's not good for you all year to go at a hundred percent. I mean, that's, I guess it's sustainable if you're, you know, coping with things, but I mean, a lot of times it, it's just going to get in the way because all you can really do is work out. So then you gradually 
like how you were tailoring things to kind of bring your protein down or up, whatever's going on, you gradually start reversing everything. So if you were doing a lot of cardio and a lot could be 40 minutes, you might say, well, I don't have time to do 40 minutes. So most of us would split them up. We're doing 20 in the morning and 20 in, in the evening and weight training one of those sessions. Then you start to lower that. You don't just cut it off because then your body, your metabolism is going to go, what's happening? Mm -hmm. So you gradually start to increase your calories again, you know, by maybe you're adding 10 more grams of protein, you know, to your day, which is split up amongst meals. So it's not like you're just adding it all in one meal. You're adding a little, a little more carbohydrate, but you're slowly bringing your cardio down so that, you know, now you're putting, you're going to put on some size, right? But then that gives you the energy, the physical energy, the metabolic energy to lift harder, to lift heavier so that you can work on the areas that you realized, okay, I thought I looked good, but you know, I want my calves to be more, it's back. Let's just use back because that's a bigger muscle group. I want my back to be bigger, but I can't lift, you know, and you've learned this. I can't lift any heavier with what I'm doing. People say they're running out of steam and it's usually because, or they're getting winded because they they haven't eaten enough they haven't fueled enough so in that same token when you're trying to get it off your cardio goes back up your protein your carbohydrates your fats they go down relatively and that's a sweet spot that takes time i mean and it takes and it's uncomfortable i'll be the first one to say you know, it's uncomfortable not knowing what's going to happen and having to just trust a process when we've been programmed to think to lose weight, we need to eat less. Well, yeah, if you're eating 3000 calories a day and you didn't realize it, but you're a snacker and, and that's a lot of calories as for a woman, then, yeah, you're going to lose quickly if someone tells you you got to cut your calories back to 2000 or so, you know, but most of the time people are consuming such low calories, 1100, 1200 like children need that, you know, yeah. that's like, and women so they're, yeah, women, right. Definitely. Because we've been programmed for that. I mean, I remember days when you're, you're told that, and even as an athlete, not thinking as Dr. Davis, but as Harriet, you know, I was like, well, what's going to happen if I do this? And then you realize, no, it's, it shows that you have a great metabolism. When you can eat 22, 2,500 calories a day and not do a lot of cardio you feel great. You sleep well. You're less irritable. Your hormones are more balanced. You know, mentally you're clear and your workouts feel amazing. And the, a lot of times your weight goes down. Uh, let's yeah. talk about protein. You mentioned it a little bit that people ask you a lot about how, uh, how you get your protein when you were bodybuilding, it uh, started bodybuilding. It was, you know, over 10 years ago. And you were a vegan, you started bodybuilding as a vegan. And we tell us how your protein consumption evolved. Uh, I, I had read that you don't, you like protein powder. Um, but I imagine that back then that oh, might yeah. be one of the only sources. And so I did do protein powder, but you know, protein can give you so much nitrogen excess that it causes gas and those things. So I definitely would only do one protein shake a day per se, like just because I didn't want to deal with all of that. Mm -hmm. um, when I hired the trainer who could get me ready for bodybuilding and she helped me go pro, um, we would do a lot of research. So there is, I forget, I think it's by Explore Asian. I should know this because I ate it every day and I hate that I ate one thing every day, but it was a black bean noodle that they had been able to extract like a lot of, I don't know what out, but it did not have a ton of carbohydrate because mm -hmm. it was black beans. Mm -hmm. I think it was like, I don't know how many grams of, of carbohydrates, but it wasn't anything crazy, maybe 17 grams or so, but it was 40 grams of protein. Wow. So my, co my coach at that time made me eat that every day. Like I haven't eaten that. I mean, I ate it every day for a year, you know, and I mean, obviously with a protein shake and then you have like your beans, your 
you know, lentils, your quinoa, you know, all those other things. Every food pretty much has some trace amount of protein. But, you know, the, the amount of times I had to eat this black bean noodles, I was at Disney with my family eating it out of a plastic bag, you know, just cold. And so I, I don't know that I ever want to eat those again. But, you know, it was definitely hard in the beginning just because and tofu has always been a part of that, too. But I do that more now just because that and tempeh, you know, just because it provides me with the protein my body likes as well as textured vegetable protein. So like your pea proteins, reconstituting that and making like black bean, I mean, TVP burgers or adding black beans to that. But it would just take so much work to try to get all the protein into, you know, your meal plan for that day. And also trying to keep the carbohydrates at a certain level where that's not going up. So I would say that's the biggest challenge with vegan nutrition when your fitness goals require you to have to have your protein at a certain level. Because I really didn't have as much muscle mass, you know, that most people would have thought because of how much I was running you know, for so many years. So it was so important to have my protein 120, 130, you know, until it was time to get on stage. And I mean, we were able to do that, but thankfully eating a vegan diet, you digest it so easily. You're not full long, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but I had to eat large volumes of food. So I was eating for volume. Uh, it, yeah, it is. When you're a bodybuilder, you, you have to measure the how many carbs versus how much protein versus how much fat and yeah. that changes throughout your training cycle. And so with lean meats, for example, it's easier to avoid the carbohydrates. Right. Um, but a lot of the, the plant foods do have carbohydrates yep. alongside it. So now as just a, a working woman, um, are, are you training for anything now? Cause I know I did hear that in uh, 2020 you had, you had plans to, I heard a, um, a podcast interview you did in January of 2020. And yeah. in it, she, the woman asked you, so when's your next, um, your next, uh, uh, competition? competition. And you said, oh, well, I think, I think you said, I'm going to start training in April. And I thought, oh girl, you don't know what's hitting the world in March. But you know <laughs> what? I lockdown. actually did three shows in 2020. You did? Yes. How? Yes. And, and you're living COVID. on video? And didn't get COVID. No, you know, Florida, you know, the oh. state of Florida. <laughs> so the, the IFBB moved everything to Florida. And we competed in Florida. Wow. And so how did you, uh, just out of curiosity, because I was living in California at the time and in Los Angeles, everything was closed, including mm. our the gym in our complex Yes, and the ocean and the trails. You were not allowed to go in for a while. So, so how did you train during that? At time? home. Mm. And then I helped one of my girlfriends, one of my best girlfriends, put a, a home gym at her house. And so I would go over and, but in the beginning, we weren't even around each other, you know, just because we were, everybody was so afraid, but my coach just asked me, what do I have at home? And I ordered some things offline that would still allow me to train. And the one thing about being mature is, you know, 20 by 2020, I've been strength training for so long. You have mature muscle. So you're, it's not going anywhere. You know, that's the thing that had made me just relaxed last year when I was recovering from surgery was I know I'm not going to lose that much muscle because I've, you know, been training for so long. You may in certain areas, but it's not going to be like if I had just started. So I trained at home. And you so I had elliptical at home. I got Peloton that year. That was the real MVP for me um, because I could get, you know, killer cardio you know, with the Peloton. I had resisted for so long. Um, I went outside and did workouts and I did a lot of body weight training, but my coach, you know, tailored my training protocol for what I had at home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good for yeah. you. Wow. Adjusting, flexible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what do you recommend for someone who wants just to be healthy and live long, uh, what, what would be the percentage of the different kinds of exercise would you recommend to your patients? Uh, the, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Here? Flexibility, yes. cardio, strength. Yes. So for just heart health in itself, and I guess I should say cardiovascular, mm -hmm. 
So what we talk about on a medical perspective is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or plaque formation. Those are the things that cause strokes, dementia, heart attack, small vessel disease like blindness, kidney disease. So th those are all the, the little small vessel diseases that occur from cardiovascular disease or atherosclerosis. 30 minutes of aerobic exercise, a minimum of five days a week. So you need 150 minutes of some type of aerobic exercise to have good heart health, open arteries, those things, you know, barring whatever else you may have going on underlying that. You should also be incorporating strength training. And it that really depends on stages and goals. So I usually, you know, tell patients three to four days a week, if you can, of some type of, even if it's resistance bands, you know, or, you know, something body weight, if they're morbidly obese, then a lot of times it really is strength training to even do body weight things. So, you know, but that's important you know, because that's going to increase your metabolism. So that's working towards the aesthetics. Whereas most people, you know, they say they care about the inside and I care about the inside. And at a certain point in life, they start caring. But, you know, it is important to move aerobically 150 minutes a week and then strength training or some resistance training three to four days a week. Stretching should also be about three days a week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you should actually stretch after, you know, you've worked out whatever your strength training is. So if it's three days of strength training, you should definitely have three days of, of some type of stretching, but flexibility training, you know, things where you're because that's going to prevent injuries It's also going to help the muscle hypertrophy the way it should, you know, so and that's still an area where, you know, I'm still trying to juggle that in because I want to have enough time to do yoga like I used to when I worked, when I had a clinic inside of lifetime, you know, because it was easy then. But now it's kind of like, okay, you only have time to get your weight training in and your cardio class is over. So, you know, still trying to juggle those things. Well, that's, that that's would be what most people deal with. So I think that's a very realistic uh, mm -hmm. goal, but something that might, people might have to just change a little bit according to their own lifestyle. They don't, might not have time for that prescription, yeah with the caveat that maybe we should make time uh, right. if we can, like when we're in front of the TV, stretch yes. or something yes. like that. Like <laughs> that's a great thing. And sometimes just getting up five or 10 minutes early, you yeah. know, and, and stretching. Yeah. As a bodybuilder, I, I'm wondering, can you tell me how it feels like, what is your body, your relationship with your body now? That's a great question. As a woman. <laughs> And That's as a, a bodybuilder exactly. and an athlete, it sounds like you've always been very aware of how you look and you want to maintain that. But especially as a bodybuilder, you have to go through that big phase down to the 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 the, uh, the phase that uh, is stage phase, which is the phase that you know everybody loves how they look, but it's not it's not sustainable. It's not healthy, so it and be, it's not healthy. It's, it's not, not healthy, healthy. Good point. So it must be hard to let go of that, and then have your Dr. Harriet Davis. I have a son and a family and responsibilities body. How do you emotionally deal with all those? So this is probably one of the best questions you could have ever asked, um, because I'm going to be 100% honest, as I always am and authentic in this. Um, it is hard, you know, because number one, you are, I'm going to answer it from the perspective of me. And then I'm going to tell you, you know, what I should be saying to patients or what I do, you know, talk with them about, right. but um, it is very hard because you don't realize that your body will do the things that it does, you know? So the first time I got on stage, I was impressed, even though when I go back and look, you know, it, it definitely your body, it's like anything else. The more you do it, it just gets better and better and better. So it becomes almost this vicious cycle, you know, and it's, it's a slippery slope at first because, you know, if you've ever struggled with any disordered eating or any of that, which I will be candid and say I have, you know, so that's where a lot of that running, you know, hours on end would come in is because I was trying to control things or, you know, my stress went up as I got closer and closer to med school and in med school and my mileage went up. It really did. It was a directly linked. 
And so, you know, most of us, unless we've been athletes, start looking at that when we approach menopause, you know, as far as that's why we start talking about weight, you know, in a woman who maybe is been normal in size and looks normal, but she knows with her clothes off that there's a little pooch here or something's different or, you know, people say, well, what's this hanging, you know, or whatever. I haven't had that. So when you've seen your body go down to being stage lean, which I, I'm going to just be honest, is not healthy because a lot of times you're doing excessive amounts of cardio. You're about to be up there almost naked, right? So you're really cutting down food. You're hungry, which all of this is affecting your sleep, you know, because your body is kind of in this stress state. So when it, if you don't like really follow that same kind of um, method that, you know, the reverse dieting, like listen to a coach or listen to whoever's instructing you on how you should be eating and exercising, you'll gain a ton of weight. You know, if you just go out after a show or go out after whatever you've been, you know, working on your physique for and just start eating normally. And, and that's you because your I body, said. is that because it's your body's not- going... Oh my God. Yeah. Thank God, Harriet's feeding right. me now. I'm going to keep it on right. because I don't know if she's going to feed me next month. Right. And <laughs> then most of the time your your brain has been in such a stress state that it's tricking you into thinking you want sweets and mm. you want fried or salty or, you know, so people are eating a lot of cookies or things that are then going to pull water into the body. So they may think they've gained all this weight and it's not really, it's just excess water you know, because of how they're eating. And so it's hard at first to look at yourself and appreciate what you're seeing. And it took many years. And I can be honest with you, even last year after I had surgery, you know, because I was training for a show, I was, I was getting ready for a show and had a herniation that required emergency surgery because it almost severed my spinal cord. And so you know, after that, I was so grateful that I could walk, you know, because of what, how it was when I needed to have surgery that I didn't even go through that part. And then towards the end of the year, as I'm about to travel and other things, you know, I'm looking and my body's healthy. You know, I mean, it, it looks great. It's healthy. And all I'm fixating on are the things that have changed post-surgery. And I had to have a serious conversation with myself and give the same grace to myself that I would give to a patient, you know, to say, you just had major surgery in which if they had not been able to successfully remove the disc from your spinal cord, you know, so decompress that and fuse your spine with hardware, you know, you might've been in a wheelchair. So I had to really reel myself in because, you know, we go back to the society standards and looking back at, well, this is what I looked like before surgery. Okay. Well, you can get back to that. And that's, so that's kind of what I tell people is your body's going to change. And yes, you know, I have patients all the time who have sought me out as their doctor because they're competing. And then they decide like they want to start a family and there's this, this tug of war and, you know, some of them need fertility treatments or other things. And, you know, they're asking me, well, why do I have to stop my protein? Well, if they keep telling you that your creatinine is high and there's creatine in this protein, and that's a a breakdown product coming through your kidney functions, and that's going to affect whatever medicines they're giving you, you have a decision to make. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to get back on stage or are you trying to have a baby? You know, and so I I have to apply that. We have to, you know, reel people in all the time because, yeah, you're going to be uncomfortable. As a woman, we go through so much. I mean, even monthly, your body changes during, you know, your menstrual cycle. You're bloated or, you know, sometimes not, but things may look different. They may not. You may have cravings. You may not feel like exercising. It's okay. It is okay if you don't exercise you know, the way you do all month, a few days, or if you've been sick, or if you travel, it is okay. Life goes on. But if you are dedicated to, you know, or committed, I guess I should say to yourself, then you'll remain dedicated to the the, the overall goal. And that is to remain active and to, you know, have a physique that will go up and down a little bit, you know, and you will love it more times than others. 
but you have to appreciate what your body does for you on a daily basis. You have the confidence to know that if there's something you don't like, generally you can change it because of your knowledge of weightlifting and body um, crafting, you crafting yes. your, your body shape. Um, and so that must, but to, so to hear you also f- have those feelings of uh, self judgment mm-hmm. is probably good for all of us uh, to, um, who feel it. Also, we didn't think you you all felt it when you're standing on that stage, but I think that it happens. You probably hear a lot about, we talk a lot about disordered eating on this show because myself uh, had bulimia and anorexia in my twenties. I'm 59 now, but 31 years abstinent, but still there, that awareness. And my partner Dotsie also was anorexic. So we, we have a lot of empathy and understanding mm-hmm. are, we talk very honestly about it on this show. Yes, and we've had yes. other bodybuilders on who've also admitted that they have some body dysmorphia. Oh, because, yep. Yeah. Uh, and so many people do. I, I imagine that in your practice, you see people with disordered eating from the standard American diet too, though. So it's rampant yes. in our society. It is. And it, and you know, a lot of it is because we are so connected now through social media So we see these illusions because we don't know if it's been photoshopped or not, you know, or surgically, you know, enhanced or not. Mm -hmm. And we see these things. And, you know, if you are not confident in who you are, or sometimes, you know, a person has not found their purpose yet. And there's, that's not their fault or, you know, it's, it's life, you know, so they're looking for something because we judge so many things on the outward appearance instead of really getting to know what's inside of a person and what makes that person tick or what's gotten them to that point, you know, so we can be judgmental as humans in general, unlike our animals, that's why we shouldn't eat them. (laughs) And, um, you know, so I still try to have grace. And a lot of times when I'm talking to patients, you know, I don't share, I mean, if they've read it or hear it, that I've struggled with disordered eating, you know, and, That's where I say, and I'm sure you've heard it from tons of bodybuilders that have struggled with the same. And I was more of a a avoidant, restrictive. So more along the anorexic, you know, my purging was over-exercising. I mean, I just was an over-exerciser and then calories low, which probably is why I had the, have all the degenerative changes in my back, you know, because of pounding the pavement. Because I've, don't think it started from just bodybuilding. You know, I really do because I had so many stress injuries, but, you know, I I would say that bodybuilding for a lot of women has probably saved their lives. Mm -hmm. But then you get to that point where, you know, you, you have to also let go and understand that you can't stay at this low body fat and this low weight, you know? And so you see people doing things Um, or using things, trying to mimic, you know, even if they're not on stage anymore. And that's where it still becomes, you know, like that vicious cycle that's more psychological than anything. What do you say uh, to your patients when they come in and want to change their lifestyle? How do you encourage them to make these changes, which you acknowledged just now that are very difficult. Uh, lifestyle changes are the hardest changes to make diet, exercise, sleep, stress, etc. cetera. Um, what, how, and you only, you don't get a lot of time with them. So, and, and, and you can't, you don't follow up with them on a regular weekly oh, yeah. basis. Yep. But not weekly, but I follow up with them. Trust oh. me because of the access that we have, they have to us 24 seven. So they, they message a lot. Oh, <laughs> where, where do you start them? What do you say? I ask them why. Mm, oh, why, because, what, why they want it or why they mm-hmm. are where they are. Mm-mm. Why, you know, when they're asking me about whatever it is that they want to do or go or change, I want to know their why, you know, I mean, it's easy for me if I understand your why, like, why do you want to look like this? Well, I want to get on stage or why do you, you know, well, because I know I'm unhealthy and I'm diabetic now, or I'm almost diabetic. And then I base it on their goal. So then I use that to try to shift their mindset, which is easy for me in the exam room because I know their medical problems. Well, if this is what we're trying to do, then this is how we need to get there. And that's one of the reasons why, 
you know, I don't know if, if I should say this here or not, but I can't recommend a 100% plant-based diet for all people. I've had people try it and they're diabetic and their carbs are just too high. Mm. You know, it could be, it could be healthy carbs, but they were coming from a place where they're not a, a well-controlled diabetic in the first place, you know, and then you're trying to add these things and they need, I mean, everything they're eating that's plant-based has got a source of carb. We just said, you know, or maybe they don't have that, but they have a ton of allergies to like legumes and soy and peanuts. So, you know, all the things like my son is allergic to um, legumes, you know? And so most people think, well, peanuts, no, that's a legume that's, that grows in the ground. And so he would never be able to be 100% vegan because he has anaphylaxis to a lot of, he can't even eat tofu, but he, you know, when he eats more plants, his eczema looks better. So anywhere that I know that I can insert it to try to help to get improvement in an underlying condition, I do, but I can't blanket it, you know, because there are just some medical conditions that ethically I know it's not going to be good for you, you know, and, but I usually, to get back to your question, find out why it is that they, they want to do that, whatever it is. And usually I know, you know, and so I then explain what it's going to take. You know, it's not just going to be a me or you and Dr. Davis thing. We got to get a team because I can't, you are right. I can't have my hands on you every day. I can't check in with you every day. They ask questions all the time, but you know, I can't initiate that. And I can't always promise you I'm going to get to your question that day. We have, you know, a certain amount of time that we have to do that. Um, while we're still seeing patients. So once I understand their why and, and figure out how committed they are, you know, then I kind of core in as much as their commitment shows. But, you know, most of the time, if it's a young, healthy person, you know, then it's it's pretty easy to convince them or to coach them in the right direction from a medical standpoint. But I, if anything else, I'll use primary prevention. Well, we can work to prevent X, Y, and Z if we do da, 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 da. And then one last question for someone who wants to go plant-based um, and we certainly respect that you think that not every, it might not be right for everyone, but if it is right for them, what would you recommend in terms of uh, making sure that they do it the healthiest way possible and I'm talking about what kind of supplements or what kind of pitfalls to avoid that you that you commonly see with people so, going vegan. I usually tell them because most people just want to jump right into it. Mm -hmm. You know, they just want to go from a standard American diet to vegan. And I, I usually encourage them to start with like one meatless meal a week. I, I tell them to join the Meatless Monday Crusade because, you know, I used to post recipes with them, but you know, you can get different recipes, you can try different, you know, uh, plant-based, you know, foods or lots of exploration. But once a week, in order to get family involved, if they're married with children, because it is hard when everybody's eating differently. And gradually, I explained to them, this does not need to be like turning a light on. It should be a gradual process. Because if you don't know what things to substitute in or what things are going to give you a lot of protein, how your body's going to respond. You know, you're going to feel like you failed, even though you haven't, if you just jump into something, give yourself the grace to be able to experiment and listen to your body. And I just encourage, you know, people to go slow to definitely invest in a couple of uh, vegan cookbooks or find some podcasts or different people to follow you know, as far as if you want to be athletic with this or a diabetic vegan, I have a book around here somewhere that uh, someone sent to me a few years ago to read. And it had, to, it was, it was very helpful for me because it allowed me, because I'm not a registered dietitian. And so I have to, you know, I don't have that extra certification. I have to send them out if I'm trying to really give them a meal plan or a, a roadmap of how they should be eating. But it was helpful for me to give them some suggestions. Thank you so much. Tell us where people can find you. So you can find me on Instagram. You can find it Diva Fit Doc. I am on um, Facebook as myself, Harriet Neely Davis. 
I'm also on Twitter as the vegan bikini doc. And um, I have a blog that I need to pick back up. That is also the vegan bikini doc. So pretty much if you just Google Harriet Davis or the vegan bikini doc, you'll find me or diva fit doc. <laughs> but IG is the place I spend most of my time. <laughs> You can see great photos of her travels there. So thank you so much, Dr. Harriet Davis, for being on the show. We really appreciate it today. You gave us a lot of great information. Thank you so much for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed this and was looking forward to it. Hey, folks. Okay, back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org and include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>